Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me as we, well, kind of uh, wave goodbye, uh, see the uh, hunting season in our rearview mirrors, still trying to get out a little bit as best we can. At least I am. Tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Hope you are too. And look into training season. That's our primary goal today. Todd Agnew from Craney Hill Kennels will join me right here with some advice on spaniel training from puppy development on up to the highest levels, you know, the blue ribbon kind of stuff and uh, why it's so important to strive for perfection and then achieve excellence, among other things. We'll talk about obedience, uh, your training goals for the off season and a lot more in that regard We'll also uh, talk about your views from my recent Upland Nation Index survey on how to maintain our hunting traditions. We'll have an Upland Nation puzzler question and a prize, and it's all made possible by Roughland Performance Kennels, Happy Jack Dog Care Products, Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food, and Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School. Yes, indeed. Well, I had a chance to sneak away right before we head for California uh, to get in one last hunt in one of my favorite places. Been going there for, well, (laughs) the cafe, general store, motel, gas station, post office has been owned by three different sets of folks since i've been going there over 30 years and you know i still discover things you know you're en route to somewhere else but you've had too much coffee so you pull over in that one spot on the old you know state highway and um get out and take care of your business and uh realize that you're looking at a one of those uh bureau of land management signs that says please close gate well what that means is it's public land beyond that gate if you want to access it hey go right ahead uh just close the gate because uh there's a grazing lease as well it so i'm looking at that one just like not not a month ago i did the same thing in a different place in the same general area and thought you know way up there there's some willows and there's maybe a couple cottonwoods and there's a couple nice folds and i see the tree line coming almost all the way down to the road here there's water there's got to be birds no i was after i was after chuckers at the time but this looked like it could start as a nice valley quail hunt and then turn into a chucker hunt so i you know put shells in the right and the left uh, pockets for one or the other and offloaded flick and there we go it was well kind of sterile it had been overgrazed uh rough drought year to begin with not much feed not much cover except those willows and they were all bare at the time but we soldiered on uh about a thousand feet of elevation gain all told uh never found anything on the way up but i did remember on the way down that there was one more water course another draw just you know a few hundred yards over so thought we went up one we'll go down the other Sure enough, we're walking down, flicks on one side of that creek, I'm on the other side with about a 30 or 40 foot chasm in between us. I look up and he's on point, skyline on the highest spot on that ridge. And in between him and me are, oh, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 feet of elevation loss and gain, plus the thickest willow um, creek bottom I've seen in a few days. Uh, sure enough though i got lucky and found a spot that was relatively brush free only one scar developing right now on my nose uh got down it got up it in stealthy manner as best i could i wasn't panting too bad by the time i got up and sure enough flick was still on point i walked past him and there's about when those quail started uh, getting a little bit paranoid about this bigger bipedaling device coming their way so they started moving and if you know valley quail at all they'd much rather run than fly and they did and they ran and they ran and i chased and i chased i finally got them in the air and they all flew before i got close enough for a shot well flicky had done his job so i um 
I popped a round into the air anyhow, and I did happen to have one valley quail from yesterday's hunt in my bag. Put that on the ground somewhere out there where he couldn't see it and sent him for the retrieve, and all was well in the world once again, except for my shooting or my lack of shots. I shouldn't put it that way. That was one particular time when I couldn't blame my bad shooting on anything. So anyway, a great a great coda to a nice walk in a wonderful place with great weather and incredible walking conditions. If you know, if you're out there in this, uh, this time of year, you know what I mean by that. The ground was still frozen. It was easy to walk on. There was very little snow. Knock wood in so many regards. Thank you, Harney County, Oregon, for your hospitality. Yeah, the Upland, podcast, the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products. They are crafted at the highest caliber. I talked about perfection and excellence a minute ago. That is Fred Bohm's goal. Sign up for their mailing list. You'll get first notice of all of their sales, all one of them every year. You'll get it before everybody else. And also the new products coming down the pipeline. Now, I've talked a lot about the Sage and Breaker firearms grease in recent weeks. It's a complement to the CLP. That's a spray-on liquid, clean lube protect. They work together, and I don't mean you put one over the other or anything. There are some places on your gun that need oil and some that need grease. CLP is for the, um, well, the the lower friction points on your gun. Um, You know what I mean. There are some places where it's easier to spray that in. Not only will it clean, it will lubricate and it will protect from all the gunk that's out there. There's kind of an anti-magnetic capability to this stuff, so it keeps all the dust from sticking to the metal. Learn all about it at sageandbreaker.com. And if you need a new gun to take care of, LegacySports.com is where you shop for pointer shotguns. Just go to LegacySports.com, click on the brand tab, and go down to pointer. They've got a little bit of everything from several grades of over and under to some semi-automatics that uh, are just right for those of you who shoot a lot at the range, for example. There's also also a youth model in their Acrius over an underline with a 12 and a half inch length of pull. So if you've got a beginner out there just getting into the sport, that might be a great place to start. You can get it in 20 gauge or 410, 26 inch barrels. It's balanced right. It's got five choke tubes. You name it, it's got it. It would be a great starter gun for a newcomer to the sport of hunting. We'll talk more about that down the road on the podcast as well. So learn all about it at LegacySports.com. Glad to have him back. Uh, The guy knows of what he speaks. He's got the ribbons to prove it, the cups, the trophies, all the things that, you know, are important to some people in some ways, but are also important for other reasons. And we'll talk about that as well. Todd Agnew is a proprietor with his lovely wife of Craney Hill Kennel. They're in Mitchell, Georgia, but I bet they get around as well. So Todd, welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you very much, Scott. Glad to be back. Okay, the first test of the day, um, grouse or woodcock? My preference? Yeah. Oh, well, grouse is just that much more difficult, of course. <laughs> springer or cocker? <laughs> uh, for the masses of springer, for those that want to get to the next level, I think cockers. Over and under or a side-by-side? Side by side, I can't keep my balance with a, with a narrow channel there. <laughs> I'm going to use that line. I, I'm writing it down. Give me a moment. Okay, thanks. Male or female? Good is good. Yeah. All right. You're you're a diplomat and a great trainer. So thank you very much. Um, you know, give us a feel. Uh, just put us in your place. Yeah, you're you're there. Uh, ho- hopefully, you're gazing out a window at incredible grounds. What's Craney Hill Kennel all about? Show me the. Give me the the fifty cent tour. Uh, well, it's about purpose, and I I would say that our niche has really been towards helping people actually enjoy the the country lifestyle with their dog. You know, these days, 
the people that have dogs live out in kennels or out in the barn and they hunt 60 days a year is, you know, pretty much gone for most people. Uh, but that doesn't mean they can't enjoy their dog. And we live in, a, in an aging population where people are starting to have more freedom just demographically. And we've kind of got a niche where people want to enjoy their dog and experience things that maybe they didn't do before. So where they may have gone and paid for a hunt, they now want to actually go hunt. And we have a big group that, you know, they're in their mid sixties, in their seventies, and they've never hunted in their life. Mm. Now they're out grouse hunting, Mm. shooting over their own dogs. So just, uh, I, I can't tell you that's what we were trying to do. It just seems to be what we do. Um, you know, it, it, it's also true at the other end of the spectrum. I got an email from one of my nephews today and said, uh, Uncle Scott, uh, you know, we fish together. We've had some adventure. I've never hunted. Would you take me hunting? That's great. Yeah. Great. So I'm, I'm really eager to kind of put, put into practice what I preach all day. Um, uh, <laughs> but y- you used a term there that I think is really important and and it's different for everybody. But tell us. If you're going to help somebody, whatever the age, uh, enjoy their dog more, what does that mean to a pro like you? Uh, for me personally, it, it, it becomes managing people. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of information out there, and that can be interpreted in many different ways, depending on how you read it. Like, you know, as you know, we can both read the same article in the newspaper, and we get a completely different story. So it's trying to filter through what somebody is saying versus what they really mean. And then it it changes as they get more education, you know, their goals and hopes and so forth, um, ultimately going to be different a year from now than they are initially. But I think so often, um, you know, your wonderful intro talks about ribbons and so forth. You know, so often we get into keeping score Mm -hmm. as opposed to what do you personally want out of this? And Uh, Most people have enough stress in life. This should be enjoyable. It should be relaxing. So on the one hand, it should be a recreational activity. And on the other hand, if you don't allow it to be a recreational activity, your dog's going to suffer. You know, the dog's going to feel that pressure and those unreasonable expectations. So I I think we really just want to get a feel for what somebody is looking for. And then it's our job to the best of our ability to provide um, that type of reward. It could be, for us, maybe it's a dog that I'm not interested in, but if it brings a person we're helping great enjoyment, um, that, you know, then, then we have done our job. And, and I'll tell you, I learned that back when we were actually getting paid to guide. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a struggle for us to get people to bring their dogs out to hunt. And sure. There's lots of reasons why people maybe aren't comfortable doing that. But the thing that I learned more than anything is if someone did bring their dog out, and if it was a dog that – you know, I do this for a living. So if it was a dog that just was never going to meet my expectation, if no matter how hard I tried, if I could finally get the customer to be able to um, get a bird, shoot a bird over that dog and get that bird back, that was going to mean so much more to them than it was ever going to mean if they hunted over what I thought were our wonderful dogs. And so it really helped shape my own management of expectations of what our role was. You know, when our role is not to make everybody else like our dogs, our role is to make everybody else enjoy their dog. You just, uh, you just nailed it, Todd. Uh, By the way, if you want to learn more about Todd Agnew and everybody at Craney Hill Kennel, go to SpanielTraining.com. Todd, um, we we have this debate everywhere. Yeah, sometimes it's not a debate; it's a one way discussion where somebody says, "Well, your dog, your dog, you that's not a finished dog." And so then I will always ask, "Well, what is finished to you and to you and to you?" And you get three different answers. Sure, sure. So it really is about what your expectations are and how how much you're enjoying that, isn't it? It isn't finished if you could write down what it is you, you want your dog to do, what is important to you with your dog. And if your dog meets those expectations, is that not finished? I mean, for somebody that lives in the suburbs and, you know, they got a hectic life and kids and they don't have a lot of free time. And most days it's a struggle to get the dog out for a walk. Maybe the expectation, the hope is, I wish I could just go for a walk with my dog and it didn't drag me down the road. Well, if that's the dog's role other than human interaction and enjoyment at, at home with the kids or something, if if the dog could just go for a walk and it could be an enjoyable walk, is that not finished to that person? 
Um, it is to me. I, I mean, I, I, I'm I not, so. I can't argue that at all. In fact, I wish my dog wouldn't pull me down the sidewalk, <laughs> but, but that, you and I will talk about that off mic later. Yeah. Um, but, um, that, that's my point and your point as well. And that's uh, part you know, we're, we're talking points, but, uh, uh, Todd, you and Christina are prim primarily flushing. I won't even say that spaniel trainers. I mean, it's in the, it's the, it's in the website address. Is that you focus on that for what reason? We're just so busy with yeah. the breed that the breed that we love. I mean, we, you know, it's not to say that we never take in another flushing dog. I, you know, to be honest, I'm like everybody, I can get bored and sometimes yeah. uh -huh. something, something, you know, sparks my curiosity and I want to play around and so forth. Um, but you know, from the, from the Spaniel standpoint that, re, you know, that really is what, what, what we enjoy the most. Oh, and I, I'm thinking already you, if one, one day, if you get bored, are you going to bring in a clumber? I've had them <laughs> and I, you know, people, you know, anyone that's been paying attention, you know, for a long time, you know, we, we renamed it Sasquatch. It wasn't the dog's name, but it's so, you know, it's so big. And, and I'll tell you, I, you know, I hunted grouse in Maine with that dog. Um, I hunted pheasant, you know, in Kansas, out in the plains there with that dog. Uh, again, an example of a dog that maybe wasn't what I viewed as my ideal dog, but our job was to give that dog exposure so that the owner could enjoy that dog. And I can guarantee you, the owner shoots birds over that dog once. That that owner is ecstatic. Oh yeah. Okay. So so it's not. Uh, you know, it's different, and all the breeds vary, and dogs within the breed vary. But uh, we we're we're pretty adamant about staying within our window of of what our role is. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to open that window just a crack more because a lot of listeners are um, they're Labrador owners. Mm -hmm. and and they use their labs in the uplands primarily mm -hmm. and so they're doing uh, basically what you would expect of a springer or a cocker or a clumber or a boykin or any any other uh, flushing breed to a great degree so i'm framing i'm telling you to frame yourself just a little bit you're thinking in that and i know you will just anything you offer us will be a value to them them as well w what is it i mean what are the Bigger, first, let's get the news out of the way. You've got so many new things going on at SpanielTraining.com. You got a forum now. You've got some online courses. Tell me what's what's up. Uh, I'm tired, <laughs> you know? and uh, you know, I only have so much energy. And we have a really good group that we work with closely. And to be honest, I, you know, it's awful hard for people to to reach out to me and to get my attention. And so it's just a, a platform. Obviously, we get compensated, but it's a platform where people, you know, can come into our window a little bit, so to speak, and, and, and get some education. It's really what it is. And so the training forum, we had run a traditional forum for a little bit where, you know, you can make posts and we'd make some comments. And I'm very clear, I'm not training anybody's dog through this, but I just didn't like the forum concept. You know, you, you tended to have a, a handful of people that were active and that's great. And, you know, forum people are wonderful, but even, you know, people we know and we work with a lot, they just, you know, a lot of lurking, uh, yeah. not, not, not enough engagement. And then, you know, I, I had to keep trying to be engaged to, you know, to try to stimulate it and so forth. And it, it just didn't work for me. Um, so we've switched it to all video format. And what I'm doing is, you know, about three times a week, about 15 minutes in total per week, uh, it gets posted and it could be anything that I'm working on. There's no set order. I could, you know, be filming three to five minutes of this puppy I'm working with on the ground, on the table, going for a walk. I could be posting a video of a dog I'm working on with some retrieving and the bulk of the video I'm narrating. <laughs> so, you know, you, you know, you gotta sit and listen to me talk, but you know, you're getting the narration of what I like, what I don't like, why I think this was a mistake or why I think, Hey, just ignore this. So you're getting an inside look uh, or a better inside look of what is going through my mind mentally, but you're getting the visual of the video. And my thinking on that is everybody just wants to go watch videos on YouTube anyway. Yeah. And this is the world, the world we live in. I'm just, uh, Scott, I'll be blunt. I'm not doing it for free. Yeah. So it's a, it's a subscription thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the class that we put up, uh, you know, those training videos have a very short shelf life. And um, we don't do things like we did five years ago. Some of them we do, but, you know, we continue to evolve. And I think any 
quality trainer probably evolves. Um, so what I've done is I've taken the first four months or so of our training is overwhelmingly done in the house. Mm -hmm. So the puppies mm -hmm. are roughly eight weeks old. They're in the house till let's say six months. So we're setting everything up in the house. All I did was I set up a camera for the growth of about 15 different dogs and just kept filming raw footage, raw footage and so forth. And so it go through more of a step-by-step -step with narration of building the foundation that we do in the house. Again, people can look at that. It's a two month subscription. They got two months to go through the, through the coursework. It's uh, I think it's about two hours long with maybe 90 minutes or so of actual dog work. And they get to see a bunch of different dogs having success, making mistakes, building back to success, you know, some different breeds, uh, just to, this is how we get all of our puppies started. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other, the other courses are not up, but of course they become, you know, more, more advanced. We move outside and do a lot of the same stuff at our table work. And then, you know, you go to the field and there's all that introduction and so forth. That stuff's just not up yet. And, yeah, I'm just busy. It it sounds like to a great degree what you're doing is you're you're not only telling people do this stuff, but here's why you need to do this stuff. And that that leads to um what we talked about off mic before we we came together here and that is uh d d train a lot of trainers will do that as well in a in a seminar or a course or just in their book or their video whatever it is. They just say here are the things to do and and all we see are the finished product, pardon the pun, I'm using that word again, but all we see are great dogs doing great work. When I, I, when we never common. we never that's get common. that, you know, uh, when you start, that's not what you have. Uh, no, you know, we're fortunate. We have a lot of dogs go through our hands, so we tend to not have any apprehension about getting going. We don't mm -hmm. buy a puppy and then say, okay, now where do I begin? Well, for most people, that's more what happens or they get yeah. the puppy and, you know, they want to start playing with it and get it comfortable before they start doing anything. Well, the, you know, the professionals tend to start training day one. It's just more than likely what other people view as training. We don't. So we're, you know, for us, it's more behavioral and getting the dogs uh, to open up their mind to learning, so to speak. Um, but I think that, um, I want, I want to be very clear. You had mentioned earlier, um, you know, sh I'm showing what people need to do and, and, and I'm adamant that is not what I'm doing. Uh -huh. I'm just, uh, I'm just offering people. This is what we do. You know, people can look at our dogs. People can look if they, if they value ribbons, they can say he has enough or he doesn't, uh, you know, he's a jerk or he's not, he's kind with his dogs. He's not, I mean, I'm, I'll let other people make all those decisions. I'm just offering, if people want to see how we do things, this is how we do it. And I'm also going to show you when it doesn't go according to plan, this is why I backed up this time. This is why I didn't back up this time. And then over time, our program, I believe in our program. And so if we trust the process for the long haul, these are the things we're going to be doing good or bad while the process is going on. Yeah, I'm reminded of my 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 book. Uh, well, the subtitle starts with observations and suggestions. And <laughs> you know, I yeah. back when I first wrote that, um, it was definitely absolutely the only way I could get away with putting a book together. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now I've learned slightly more, but I still it's still coming out with the same subtitle on the new edition. But anyway, you you, you explain that very carefully, and I I get it. Um, but you've used the term a couple times and if you could kind of give us a feel for what the program is, uh, think of it as a, as a merge between historical retriever training and historical pointing dog training. Mm. You, you'd asked about what retriever people could do. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to hunt upland with your retriever, my mindset on that is that it is not a retriever. It is, it is a spaniel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the retriever program tends to be very obedience focused early on coupled with marking. Get it. And yeah. the reason for that, I believe, and I, you know, obviously this is what they do, not what I do, but I, I believe the value in that is because the retriever's job is primarily to retrieve. 
and that is overwhelmingly going to begin with the dog next to the handler. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, those line manners and the control, it, it's vitally important. You know, an unruly dog in the duck blind or at the dove field, you know, obviously is unruly. Well, the pointing dog people, you know, those dogs got to take in big grounds. You know, they're trying to find cubbies and so forth. So, uh, you know, it, it would be much more about confidence and giving the dogs bold and confident running at distance. Well, you know, Spaniels would be in between. You know, we want them to find game like pointing dog. Get out there and rock and roll and go find it. But because they don't point or shouldn't point, you know, I can't shoot game if I find it at 100 yards. So now I need more control like the retriever so I can keep the dog within an acceptable range. Mm -hmm. So everything we do is built on here's the end goal. How do we get there? So we're going to begin very early, seven, eight weeks, with obedience work. When I say that, it really is just clicker and treats. We're trying to build marking behaviors. Um, so when we see something we like, we're going to mark that behavior. When we mm -hmm. see something we don't like, we're going to ignore it. Over a series of events, generally the first year of their life, they are never corrected with us. Okay, so um, because we believe in the marker training, mark the good, ignore the bad. Yeah. In addition to that, during that first year, we're then going to try to build their confidence by giving them birds. Generally, we use you know, Johnny houses just economically. You know, we can get more flushes that way. Yeah. So that the dog goes out there and runs. If we do it correctly, at the end of the year, we'll have a dog that essentially is a hunting dog. It's going mm -hmm. to run around. It's mm -hmm. going to be happy, excited, find the game, and it's going to have a level of control because we've marked what it is we want, and more importantly, the dog trusts us. We've given the dog an incredible amount of freedom to learn to make choices. We've just set it up so that the choice is ultimately, more often than not, are the choices that we're looking for. So then the dog becomes comfortable with those choices, and then it's more willing to take advanced training down the road. Boy, that, you summed it up just right. That's Todd Agnew with Craney Hill Kennel. I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Oh, my. Um, I don't even know where to start there, but I do. I'm still, I feel like Sir, Sir Galahad. I'm still in quest of the reason to use a clicker. Can you, can you just, I mean, sum it up for me, Todd. Come on. Okay. Dogs like it. It's that simple. Huh. There is, people should think of the clicker as saying good dog. Yeah. That's all it is. You just mark in a behavior. So if you understand that you, when the dog does something, you mark it, voice, clicker, a buzzer, it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. But what, what I have found is that there's the sound of a simple box clicker that is very excitable to dogs. And so I want to work in that environment because I know, I mean, people have been listening to this. They know you can get sick of my voice. I'm yeah. sure the dogs can too. <laughs> and my, and my voice, my tone can change depending on the mood I'm in. If I'm tired, you know, how excitable I am. Mm -hmm. So you want a very consistent sound to mark that behavior. I, that's, th that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. That, that, that is, you know, everybody, uh, you know, I talk with a lot of people about this topic and, and they've never gotten, they've never boiled it down to that fundamental aspect because we do have a voice and we use it. We use it sometimes the wrong way. And you just pointed that out and I, I get it. Um, <laughs> we can go off on that tangent later, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, um, uh, tell me how you got into, uh, how, how'd you become a, uh, a dog trainer, kennel owner, field trial consultant slash competitor? I, uh, you know, like most people, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to grow up around dogs and hunting and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we put birds in the bag. So clearly the dogs must've been good. And, um, you know, I mean that in jest, obviously. Yeah. And, uh, later on in life, um, you know, I had jobs and, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a little bit of success. So I was exposed to, you know, fine dining and fancy resorts and hunting clubs and all those types of things. And so I got a little bit more interested as I, you know, was more exposed to different types of dogs and so forth. And uh, I started to see what, you know, truly quality dogs could do. 
And to be honest, I, you know, I just quit. I, you know, I had a job that was horrible and my worst days now are far superior to any great day. You know, the checking account isn't what it was, but <laughs> if, you know, if, if that's a, a big reward to you, I don't suggest you do this, but mm-hmm. if you, you know, if you like dealing with animals and being left alone and, and, and working on communication with an animal, uh, which is really what it's all about, it's incredibly rewarding. Yeah, like the bumper sticker says, the more people I meet, the more I like my dogs. <laughs> yeah, right. It's right. it's so true, and you know, the, the, you know, you could you could do worse when it comes to the, uh, the size of your checking account. You could be uh, that's right. that's a TV right. producer. <laughs> But think of all the notoriety. Yeah, yeah. You can't you can't buy the groceries with that. Um, we got a lot more to talk about, and, and then there's also some other things we're going to talk about after Todd departs us, including uh, how everybody out there feels about the 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 state of our sport and how to how to save it, if you will. Plus a quiz, uh, the Upland Nation puzzler, and a prize. It's all coming up in just a couple minutes. Todd, you get a little bit of a break, and then we will. We'll be back with Todd Agnew of Craney Hill Kennels. Learn more about him at SpanielTraining.com. In just a few moments, we'll reconvene. And right now, let me remind you that we are brought to you by HappyJackIncorporated.com. HappyJackInc.com. They might be able to save you a trip to the vet. Uh, once again, I am just waving my hands in glee. Flick after um, two or three weeks of running in snow and the you know that's the risk on his pads more than anything because it just softens them too much anyway out there in the desert the high desert he was doing great on that stuff and one of the reasons is i still treat his pads with happy jack pad coat daily during a hunt and weekly when we're not hunting so uh, think about that it's one of the many great products at happyjackinc.com also check out their flex enhance plus that's their well their solution to the arthritis that many dogs you know some dogs can get arthritis as young as one year old learn more about flex enhance plus and what it can do for your dog it's all at happyjackinc.com I think I used every rough land kennel product I had this past weekend on that little quail and chucker hunt uh, from the um, food bowls, the water bowls. Yeah, worked perfect for me. Of course, the performance crate, uh, the water storage that we have, and then the dry gear storage we have. You want to learn all about their full line. It's at Rough Land kennels.com r-u-f-f roughlandkennels.com take a look at their slant back that's their performance kennel for sport utility vehicles i know you got a little bit less room in there you want to save some space but give your dog as much space this is engineered and designed just to take advantage of all of those things it's all at roughlandkennels.com And this is where I hope that Todd Agnew with Craney Hill Kennel stuck with us and wasn't afraid. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Sometimes, no, I've never been stood up, um, but uh, but appreciate your waiting. And Todd, you know, if if we were just to jump in and 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 ask you the the pressingest question, if you will, it's about hunting in general. What do you love so much about bird hunting? Well, I like the teamwork with the dog. That's why I'm a flushing dog person. You know, uh, I do like spaniels, but they're just a flushing dog. Could be a lab or whatnot. Uh, you know, I, I, I've shot over pointing dogs and the quality pointing dog. I, I just don't feel as part of the process. You know, the dog goes and does its deal. It's on point. You, you know, you walk up, flush the birds or they flush, you know, whatever you can, method you're going to use, you shoot the birds and then you go back on vacation while the dog goes back to work. So, uh, you know, that doesn't really work for me. The retriever game, uh, you know, I've, I've done done ducks, and I, you know, wishing for bad weather and then getting up early to go out <laughs> it just isn't my, you know, just, just doesn't work for me anymore. You, you forgot cold uh, and wet. <laughs> I, well, and you know, they, so I can go shoot ducks in the afternoon, but you got to pick decoys up wet in the dark. So, um, you know, that just isn't that particularly interested to me. And uh, you know, I 
I do like a dog that listens and pays attention and does what it should do. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not great in the level of manners control that the retriever people require at a high yeah. level. It's yeah. just not my personality. Yeah. So uh, I, I respect that stuff. I mean, I'm not here to bash whatever anybody else does. I just do what we do. You know, you, you just hit on something that I've, I'm, I'm beginning to appreciate more and more. Um, I'm, I fell in love with pointers for the point. That's what got me, that. That's what made me buy a shotgun. And I'm still intrigued by that. Every time I work with my dogs and everybody else's dogs, I get to work with on TV and everywhere else. But you just alluded to something that I want you to tell me more about, and that is that um, I don't know what to call it besides commun- a level of communication uh, between you and a, and a spaniel in the field. W- describe that to me. Um, you know, a, a friend of mine, am I, am I okay to mention his name? Of course. Okay. So a friend of mine, Mike Gould, you know, he's an old retriever guy. He, you know, has written you know, various books and so forth. And he's been around the country in some different places. Uh, someone that I really respect uh, the more I was around him as a dog guy. And he talked to me, you know, years ago about what he called elasticity. And the way he explained it to me was if you put you and your dog in, an, in a rubber band, an elastic band, and as you go through the field or the woods, you know, sometimes that dog is pulling you right? And the Mm -hmm, elastic band mm -hmm. doesn't break, but you need to, you know, pick up the pace and so forth. And then sometimes, you know, you're pulling the dog back. And if you, if you pull too hard, the rubber band, uh, rubber band breaks. So um, it's elasticity over the years, as I you know have dwelled on that and tried to apply it and consider it, uh, I've kind of flipped it, you know, because you know, our, our own little market in here, um, we flipped it to playing the sheet of music. And I am not a musician at all. But I view it as, you know, when we get out to the, you know, to the ground that we're going to hunt, you know, the, the ground becomes the sheet. Mm-hmm. And so there's different factors, right? Wind and cover, terrain, you know, just different things. Well, those factors become the notes on the music sheet. Yeah. And then the dog becomes the instrument. And then I am the conductor. And so if you watch a conductor at times, they're getting really animated and they're pulling the level up, right? And then at other times, they're slowing down and trying to settle the music down. So, uh, you know, I, I think that our role as the conductor is to read the music as, we, as we're as going about our hunt. And we're trying to give this communication to the dog and read the communication the dog is coming back to us so that we can play the music as beautiful as possible. That's how I do it. And, you know, I would only add to that, uh, the music never stops. With a pointing dog, uh, perhaps the music stops a lot uh, based on what you described earlier. Um, only, only, only the way, I, you know, the way I would explain Exactly. It. I, I, yeah. You know, I, 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 I've heard the same explanation about the point, mm-hmm. you know, a dear friend of mine loves pointing dogs. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's, he loves it. And he had said to me a long time ago in a, in a, in a deep Southern drawl, he said, you know, when that dog goes on point, you either get it or you don't. Yeah. And I'm just somebody that doesn't. And, you know, I've had that discussion with my wife about this topic, <laughs> no, about many others as well, but I know, what you, but there is that, you know, I, I want to, I, I like elasticity and, and I want to, and I like the music analogy because I was a musician, um, uh, but I would take it to the jazz genre instead, because in, in, in real good jazz, everybody on the bandstand has to pay attention to everybody else on the bandstand all the time. Okay because the drummer does something that affects the bass player that affects the piano player that affects the saxophone player and vice versa and vice versa and vice versa the whole time that uh, i think spaniel jazz is um, is kind of cool for that very reason you're you're constantly paying attention it's a two-way street and yeah. we need them yeah. to pay, you know we need yeah. them to yeah, pay sure. attention yeah yeah Oh, okay, so you can explain this to me. Every time we do a TV shoot and there are Cocker Spaniels involved, mm-hmm. at some point uh, I've got the handler and me, dog out there somewhere in the field, and a cameraman, usually Lynn Berland, oh, 25, 30 feet away from me, and he's pointing at the handler, and that Cocker 
jumps into the handler's arms. And I swear <laughs> it's because he says, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me be a bird hunter. I am so grateful to be here today. You ever get that? You do, <laughs> you, you, you do realize that they're born with that gene that I they use it. just to just to suck you in. It's a, okay. I, 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 I love every every bit of it. It's and it's a tradition with us. <laughs> well, I, I will say my experience has been that the cockers genetically like to leap. They yeah. are yeah. phenomenally athletic, you know, which is just remarkable. Such a little dog. They are far far more athletic than our springers isn't that interesting because of course springers uh were effectively bred to spring but mm -hmm. but some people say that means spring off the ground some people say spring the bird out of the off the ground but uh, but i have never not done a tv show where that's not happened that's a lot of yeah, negatives, they, uh, but they like it. They like it. Yeah, they do. Isn't that the truth? Um, you, you've kind of covered your program, but you use an, you use an acronym that I really like T R I P, um, in a hundred words or less, what's the point of trip? Well, we want to use it for everything that we teach because you know how those, how those work. It makes it easier to remember the steps. Yeah. So the T is for teach. It's pretty basic dog training. You want to teach what you're looking for. So we want to teach the task. And then R is we want to reward it. So when the dog offers the behavior that we're working on, we want to reward that behavior, the clicker, the treat, yeah. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then once the dog is giving us that predictable behavior, then the I is we want to start to increase the difficulty. So maybe in the beginning, it is we want the dog to hop or sit. And so the dog may sit sideways, but over time, we're going to work that finer and finer. And we want the dog to sit facing us. Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. And then the P is for polish. We want to polish the behavior so that we have a conditioned response that we can rely on for whatever it is we're doing. It, and for all of these, uh, you're using voice commands are you using anything else actually for probably the first eight or nine months no voice commands wow we are purely going off i mean we are commanding yeah you understand our, bo our body language sends messages and so forth okay but we're we're just trying to reward you know uh -huh. mark uh -huh. the times yeah. that the dog offers the behavior and we continue to mark that the dog earns a click in the treat the dog starts to figure out mm -hmm. if i offer this mm -hmm. behavior i can get what i want once the dog is doing it predictably, yes. we'll, we'll then overlay the command. Duh. Makes all the sense in the world. Okay. Um, pretend um, I've showed up um, and I've got a dog and I've, uh, I've what, what are the three most important things you, you need to teach me to do with my spaniel? Number one, without ever even seeing your dog, patience. Mm-hmm. Because it's just, it'd be an anomaly that I would think you have too much patience. <laughs> <laughs> so, so number one, we're going to, you know, bring out those aspects of, to show you why I think you don't have enough patience. Okay. Um, the other thing is m most people are convinced their dog knows a whole lot more than it does. Yeah. So, you know, the most common thing with that is, you know, somebody walks, show me that your dog sits. So they walk around on a leash and they tell it to sit. And then you tell them, okay, could you do it this time without stopping? Uh, then they do, they do that, but they have their hand up in the air. So can you do it without talk, without stopping or having your hand in the air? And ultimately what you find out is the dog doesn't know what the word sit means. Mm -hmm. They know that when you stop or you hold your arm up. So the dog has learned it, but not the way you think. Okay. And, and then probably the third thing is we really want to narrow down best we can what it is you're looking for the dog to do as opposed to what did you read in the book? Mm -hmm. What did you read on our website? You know, what is in the end, how many days are you going to hunt? How are you going to hunt? What does that look like? What is it when you go on the hunt that you need the dog to do? What's the home life like? How willing are you to do what it takes? What, you know, those things are important so you don't put undue stress on the dog when you're trying to go through all this teaching. If you had to um, narrow it down to a few pieces of gear that we, we will put to use, we will wear out in our training and our hunting, 
career? What what are those pieces that that we need to own? Clearly, a clicker, the way we do things, you know, and we use clickers with adult dogs, okay, and not to the same level or you know as repetitively, but clearly a clicker, mm-hmm. a pe- a simple piece of rope, uh-huh. so you have a leash, yeah. okay. Um, you know, whistle is is helpful at distance, but mm-hmm. you know. It's okay. Um, and some type of touch stick, which is a target or a target stick so that if you can teach target in almost everything we're going to ask the dog to do involves some type of target training. No, oh, interesting. So that, that would be it. I came across one of my, my wife was a competitive dressage rider. So she's got a bunch of sticks of yep. very, various lengths, um, and severity, I would presume. Um, mm-hmm. And I know in the past, uh, some trainers have called them healing sticks, uh, but you're not, I don't think that's what you're describing. It, it, it is not. Essentially, we put a, uh, one of those plastic practice golf balls <laughs> on, the, on, on the end of an old arrow, you know, from a, from a hunting arrow. No arrowhead on that, everybody. Yeah. Please remember. Yeah, right. that. <laughs> good, good, good catch. Um, and so, through a series of exercises, you know, association, click and tree, the dog starts to touch that little ball. Okay. And now, like I can lead the dog anywhere I want. So now, all of our dogs learn to heal with that touch stick before they ever have a leash on them. Huh? Because they're basically following the ball. Yeah, and and they've been rewarded for touching it. So now, yeah. as you start to take the reward away or make yeah. it intermittent, dogs mm-hmm. start working harder, and you can walk them through crowds of people and all sorts of things. Think of the when I don't know, do they still have the circus? Um, but you know the old circus, the you know the the animal trainers, they were always in there with a target stick, they, moving the dog to the did. different jumps and everything. Yeah, yeah. that's all of this. That's all of this. Fascinating. Even the elephant guys had what well, they'd call it a whip, but most of the time they didn't whip anything with it. Yeah, yeah. What about um, what about keeping your dog close on a hunt? You know, you alluded to it and how important that is. I get it because, I, you know, when I miss birds, most of the time it's because my dog is pointed at 312 yards. I can't get there in time. <laughs> and that's when I wish I had a spaniel. But how how do you start that? I get that question a lot, and I know a lot of folks have a lot of ways to train that. But what is your f- basic philosophy? I think the dogs is going to be horrible. It's just, they're just like kids. Yeah. So the more you try to tell a child not to do something, the more they want. It. <laughs> so I think it's, it, it's always worse to try to teach your dog to not do something than to teach your dog to do something. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the training for range is to try to teach your dog not to go out there. Well, at a very young age, I believe that let them go out there uh-huh. and, and you know, kind of like get it out of their system and realize that there's nothing that great well, and reward them when they choose to come back, give them an incentive that it's great to be back around you. So we use Johnny houses, I, you know, I, Johnny houses, yeah. you know, it's just, I, I, I assume everybody knows what that is. You can explain it. Or whatever. I will. Yeah. Um, but with the Johnny house, it's a way that we can give them so many birds yeah. that, you know, they kind of, the adrenaline of the bird, I don't want to say the dogs don't want birds anymore, but what happens is they realize they can't catch them. Yeah. So they, they are more quickly to want to come back to the Johnny house and find another bird or, or where they, that one just flushed and so forth. And, and so what we do along with that is arbitrarily, while they're running around, if they ever come back near us, you know, we click and treat. Uh-huh. So, so now the clicker, the treat, it doesn't mean you're getting put up in, into the crate and we're going home. If, we, if we're working on here, we're not saying here, getting the dog, then putting a leash on it and putting it away. We'll go back and find some more birds. So the, so the dog doesn't build up this, I got to get away, I got to get away, I got to mm-hmm. get away. Mm-hmm. And we don't have le- you know, long lines, leashes on our dogs you know, until they're old enough. If you live in the suburbs or something, that's going to be really difficult. It's going to be unsafe for the dog. But part of the problem is all that restriction, first thing the dog wants to do when it gets off a leash is take off. Yeah. You, you, you said something, I got to say it now or I'll forget it. And that is to a, to a great degree that the, the, the clever train, a clever in the best of, of, 
descriptions. I, I mean, the good trainers I know will use birds as a reward in various ways. And it sounds like you're doing basically the same thing with your, uh, your Johnny house strategy. Now, now maybe some people don't know that's basically a, a pen where, where you can keep quail most of the time and the, and then you can release quail from there and they'll fly out into the field and they will they will be air washed if you will and the birds are out wherever they want to be and you run dogs through those fields and then the birds when they fly back at night they go back to their pen now am i hearing you use them in a slightly different way um, no, no, that, that's absolutely what it is. Okay, all right. Um, uh, yep, no, no difference. It's just we can get the dogs into many, many more birds yeah. because, you know, even if 50% of them come back, mm -hmm. that means that's 50% of the birds we can use again. Yeah, so. exactly. And and so the idea being uh, the birds are closer, so why would a dog go far away? Um, Probably not how we view it, Scott. Okay. It's just a case that... You know, when we start this and the dogs are young and the birds fly out of the dog's range, yeah, they come back looking for more birds. Uh -huh. Well, then over time, they start to develop that really the fun is hunting, not chasing. And range tends to be tied to chasing. Oh. So like like South Dakota, for example, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. you know, legendary for pheasants and so forth. So years ago when we would operate out of there, um, it was great for young dogs because there were so many birds. The problem is that if, a, if you had a dog that chased for, uh, let's call it 50 yards initially, there was a strong likelihood that when it lost interest in that bird at 50 yards, it may run into another one. Yeah. And now it puts that dog out at 60 yards and then another one and at 80 yards. So the dog starts to learn if it keeps chasing, it will run into another bird. So it is rewarding itself to continue chasing further and further away. I have so, just made a note of that. Uh, Flick and I will be working on something like that very <laughs> soon. So uh, what we want to do is we want the with the Johnny House, you know, and they quail and they fly out in the woods, and you know, they, you can't see them for a quarter mile like you can, you know, pheasants in pheasant country. Is we want to get them excited about birds, but we want to encourage them to come back to us so we're rewarding them for coming back whether that's through treats you know a nice pet on the head additional birds but if they have no reason to come back to you why would they come back that's just you'd think if we thought like a dog that would be so obvious but we don't do we? No, <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's obvious to the dog. We don't think like that. That's for yeah. Sure. Um, I love it. And, uh, and boy, if I had a dog that would only chase 50 yards, I'd be grateful. Believe me. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I am reminded of my very first wire hair and I, I, I was so desperate once I went to the guru of wire hairs out here and I said, my dog, he's always out at 300, 350 yards. Or I think that's what this is before collars, you know, um, uh, <laughs> And he said, well, that's because there's no birds between you and him. <laughs> and I thought, you, you know, he's right. And uh, maybe I should have picked up on it way back then, but I didn't. Uh, right. So it's the complete opposite with the yeah, pointing dogs. You, yeah. want, you know, you want the dog to run bigger, put the birds out further. Yeah, precisely. Uh, yeah. And vice versa, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there we are. And uh, it seems to be ringing true in the spaniel world as well. You know, uh, you have a lot of videos at SpanielTraining.com. You have now the forum where you're using those a lot. Of all of those, is there one, you, you look at this stuff, I'm sure you do. Uh, is there one that is most popular? Is there one that just keeps, you know, getting all the attention? And why is that? So um, understand that I know almost nothing going on with our website and all that. Okay, that's that's Christina. That's her deal. Okay, <laughs> um, but but she you know, obviously does tell me what she sees happening. So there's two things that I'm always amazed by. The number one photo always is of me walking multiple dogs at heel. I'm a dog, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm I, I'm a dog trainer. I think that is nothing other than. You know, Christina snapped a picture when I was casually doing something. But for people that overwhelmingly struggle to have their dog heal, it's the number one question problem we run into with, you know, with people and their dogs. 
um, they find that to be really impressive. So that always surprises me. The, the video that surprises me, and don't ask me where it is on there, I have no clue, but there was a while where we were putting these training tips up once a week. And I got so tired <laughs> of people complaining about the dogs jumping on guests when they came to the door and so forth. Yeah. Along, along my lines of teach the dog to do something versus, you know, don't try to teach it not to jump on people. Mm -hmm. So we had, you know, a young puppy that, you know, understood what a you know, place board was, of course. And so, you know, one afternoon over about three hours, actual about 20 minutes of training time, but, you know, spread over the afternoon, we took that little puppy and we moved it from just knowing where the place board was to that when the doorbell rang, the puppy would run to a place in the house where that board was, sit down, we'd answer the door, we'd talk a little bit at the door, we'd invite the guest in, would they come into the house, come into the living room or something, and the puppy stayed on the board until we invited it in, in to come socialize. And people just went gangbusters over that video. I, I can't I man, I'm gonna have to go watch both of those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. Oh my. Uh, all right. So speaking of your website, spanieltraining.com, it's it's brilliant. It's kinda like I came up with one that finally worked, findbirdhuntingspots.com. Um on many of your pages over there um you talk about what you're doing what you're offering where you're doing seminars or whatever except october <laughs> tell me season. more that's grouse season you know, as, yeah. as you know we run we run the trials you know the problem with the trials is that they have those during you know, bird season yep and um i I am unwilling to give up on hunting. So, you know, some different theories about, you know, those are trial dogs, not hunting dogs and so forth. And of course, all the games back in the day, it was the same dog. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I've been unwilling to give in to that. So I believe that it should still be the same dog. So all of our trial dogs hunt. We will only work with people that hunt their dogs. Um, so October, we're in the grass woods. Yeah. Um, now, you know, we're, we're training. We're always training. That's what we do. So we're running young dogs. We have people coming up to work their dogs in that environment. Yeah. Because you know, it's not it's not canned. It's the real environment. It is to me that is the real field trial. Um, we you know we did that for years, and we still do you know some of the pheasant hunting with that. But after guiding pheasant hunting for so long, I, you know, I just enjoy the woods. I'm from New Hampshire. I like the woods. It's where I'm comfortable. I think it's pretty and all that good stuff. And October is a wonderful time to be in the woods. So during that month, you know, very select people have access to us because there's only so much time and, and, and so forth. So uh, that's where really kind of unavailable then we still will go we go to michigan because we can still access some of the trials it's mm -hmm. easier mm -hmm. to get to those weekends than it is from georgia obviously uh, but we're we're hunting we're trying to get the young dogs to learn how to find real birds not the birds i put out in training i love it and i'm uh, <laughs> we're wrapping up the season now as we speak but i'm already looking forward to next season and do doing actually more rough grouse hunting next season so uh, i'll keep you posted todd agnew is uh half of the team at craney hill kennel christina is the other half and uh, you can learn more about all of them at spaniel training.com always a pleasure learned many more things than i deserve to learn in one conversation todd thanks again for being a part of the upland nation podcast thanks for having me scott okay tata -ta, as they say and the rest of you stick around because we've still got a few more things to talk about here at the Upland Nation, including a new puzzler question and a prize and the latest news on what you think is important. Oh, and your favorite dog breeds, by the way. It's all coming up in just a moment. First, of course, um, Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food. They've been a longtime sponsor for a lot of reasons. Number one, it's my dog food of choice. By the way, Flick loves it. We use the momentum formulation there. Now's the time to start getting your dog back into condition. If your dog hunts hard like mine, you know, Flick, he lost four pounds last weekend. <clears throat> he ran about 35 miles, and uh, 
I'm only feeding in the evenings on hunting days. So uh, we got to put that weight back on in the right way with the right ingredients, the right proteins, the right fats in the right proportions. Learn more about all of that at drtims.com. And just for you, 30% discount on your first order. Just use the code Upland Nation. Free delivery right to your door. Yeah, it's about as convenient as you can get, and it is uh, probably the uh, best dog food you'll ever find from a source and ingredient basis on down. D R T I M S dot com. And if you're like me, you can blame your shooting on all sorts of things, including I need a new gun. So Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School is where I am going to shop for my next gun. Now, they are um, a browning dealer, midvalleyclays.com. You can peruse all the browning choices there, including the latest iterations of the A5. If you're looking for a semi-auto that has everything you need, whether it's for the woods, the uplands, or the waters, that's where you'll find it. Some new features and camo treatments, maybe uh, looking at Speedload Plus, the nickel Teflon coating, stock shim so you can fit it the way you want. It's all available on the Browning A5 at midvalleyclays.com. Call Dave Fiedler and tell them what you're looking for. They'll probably have something in stock in the Browning line that'll fit for you at midvalleyclays.com. Well, I appreciate all of you who have responded to the Upland Nation Index. That's the annual survey I do. Send that out and you send the answers back to me. It's always fascinating. In fact, uh, much of the information you share ends up being a part of this broadcast, some of my own writing, the podcast, uh, I mean the, uh, the website, of course, Facebook topics are all there first one is always more fun than anything else and that's why i put it number one on the list what is your current favorite dog breed and uh, insights uh, always of value interestingly for the first time in many many years the german short-haired pointer is the favored breed for 24 percent of you usually it's neck and neck with the labrador retriever but this year Labs down to 19%, and then everybody else a smattering of everything else beyond that. But short hairs have come to the fore. No judgment there from anybody, right? Exactly right. And then uh, the one that's most important to me right now, how are we going to preserve our sport for the next generation and the next generation? Well, you all have your thoughts on that, and you shared them with me as well. Top of the list, 75% of you think the best thing to do right now to ensure the long-term life of hunting is to recruit new hunters. Take them hunting, 75% of you right up there. 57% of you think the best thing we can do right now is increase access to private ground open to public hunting whether it's funding uh, walk-in and related programs or uh, using more crp as public access those are the things that are critical to us right now you can't argue with all those there are a whole bunch of other choices there and they all make sense to me but those are the ones that are top of mind for all of us right now in the upland nation Well, there's your reward in advance for the Upland Nation Puzzler. I got another question for you. And at the end of the month, I'll award a very rare Signature Series Comfort Collar from my own collection. Can't buy them anymore. This is out of my personal stash. Message me on Facebook with your answer if you have the answer to this question. What is a primary cause of the medical condition your dogs might get? that is called pancreatitis. All right, just look it up, pancreatitis. Find out one of the primary causes 
and you're entered to win that signature series comfort collar believe me it is comfortable yes i have worn one just to prove the point any of the facebook pages what is the primary cause of the medical condition called pancreatitis and that all has been brought to you by findbirdhuntingspots.com. You never know, you might learn about pancreatitis there. You can certainly learn about Scratch, the German shorthair, back from the dead twice. This is a dog I've hunted with several times. The story is incredible, inspiring, and probably of value to you no matter what breed you own. It's all at findbirdhuntingspots.com. And with that, I'm going to turn you loose to go train your dog, maybe get in one more hunting trip. Please tell your friends about the Upland Nation podcast. And if you will leave a rating or a review, I would sure appreciate it. Thank you, Mark Bowman, for your recent review. I'll leave you with this. Uh, I don't know where it came from first, but man, it is uh, they are words to live by. Dogs are like potato chips. You can't have just one. Until I see you right here next week, maybe I'll see you in the field. Thanks for listening.